but all right we'll get it started then we've only got a few well we'll take a five minute um icebreaker here <clears throat> give everybody a chance to talk about their pets what is your pet situation do you have a pet have you ever owned a pet for me i've had rare uh, rarely have i had pets in the past i don't have any now but i have one daughter that has a bird and another daughter that has a rabbit right now and that's that's our current pet situation anybody else you guys like talking about your pets I just can tell you that I'm afraid of dogs. I don't <laughs> like pets at all. And anytime I cross a dog, I close my eyes. So <laughs> it's quite special. So yeah, so I have I actually, if people have a pet and if I go to the house, it's tricky for me. <laughs> Very nice. And my, my kids, they got a um, uh, hamster, but I never touch it. I always manage to have a lot of space between the hamster and myself. And I managed to never touch it. And it cost me a lot of money because every time I was away, I had to pay someone to take care of the hamster. When my kids were away for two months, I have to pay someone to take care of the hamster because I didn't want to be close to the hamster. I hear you. Very good. Who else? I love dogs, but I, my apartment is small, so I cannot have one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Uh, we we actually have three cats. So we are we are cat people. Nice. Um, I brought one into the relationship and my fiance had two, so two and one makes three. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a lot of good. Cats are more, more independent than dogs, right? They... I, I I don't know. Someday we'll get a dog, but right now three animals in a house is more than. A... <laughs> I mean, dog dog is more friendly than cat. Cat that doesn't matter if you are here or not. So they are more independent. <laughs> depends on the cat. Depends my, on the cat. Yeah, but... my mom, my mother have four, and if someone arrive in the in the house they disappear <laughs> they, they didn't like you that's funny Mansa, any pets uh, in your life um i have a pet back home in india uh and here i have a lot of plants so i consider them as pets <laughs> <laughs> there you go <clears throat> it's much easier to maintain i think actually I take that back. We've killed a fair number of plants in my in my life too. So, hey Chun Li. Hello. We were just talking about pets. Do you guys have pets? <laughs> no, we've been talking about uh, a dog, but uh, we haven't. Uh, the The list is uh, mi is miles long to get a dog <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Well, good. Um, well, that brings us then to about the time, uh, about five minutes after <clears throat> after the hour. Um, and I want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Is it everybody can see it okay? All right, good. I, I have a hard time with the controls, knowing what's being displayed and what's, what's not being displayed, but I, I think I've got it now. All right. <clears throat> well, then we will kick it off. So, for today, we will, I'm going to put up the housekeeping slide again, just to keep it in front of everybody. And then we're really just going to dive into chapter seven and do a few of the sections of chapter seven. And then, then we'll wrap up. <clears throat> I don't know if we'll go the full hour, hopefully. Um, hopefully we will. We'll try to manage the time as best we can. Okay. So again, when it comes to the, to the housekeeping, um, sorry, let me, okay. When it comes to the housekeeping, everybody has their video cameras. I appreciate that very much. We'll, um, we, I, we've talked in the past about going fast. I think we may go a little slower today to make sure that everybody um, can work through the, the exercises and think through them in particular. Um, I should say also here, go ahead and launch your R interface if you haven't launched it already, because we'll, we'll get the chance to go through some exercises and prepare some visualizations as we go through this. Okay, take time to learn the theory and then make sure that you do the exercises 
if you get a chance to teach one of the lessons, that's a really good learning opportunity as well. So keep that in mind if one comes up. Okay. Um, anybody had chances to do the exercises in chapter seven so far, at least the first few? Gotten a chance to look through them a little bit? All right. If not, we can, we'll go through them today. All right. <clears throat> so this chapter is, is about exploratory data analysis. Okay. And there's two things, two quotes that come from the book that the authors have have shared. Um, the first one says, this chapter will show you how to use visualization and transformation to explore your data in a systematic way, a task that statisticians call exploratory data analysis or EDA for short. EDA is an iterative cycle. You generate questions about your data, search for answers by visualizing, transforming, and modeling your data and use what you learn to refine your questions or generate new questions. Okay. Then the other, <clears throat> the other quote says, your goal during EDA is to develop an understanding of your data. There is no rule about which questions you should ask to guide your research. However, two types of questions will always be useful for making discoveries within your data. You can loosely word these questions as, what type of variation occurs within my variables and what type of co-variation occurs between my variables, okay? So just some, some, some ideas and some ways of thinking about exploratory data analysis. Now, what I thought was is maybe the most interesting about this is that our ability to do exploratory data analysis is going to really take off after we learn the, the ins and outs of the R language, right? So, so I feel like these kinds of, this kind of thinking that that uh, that require or that exploratory data analysis is built off of kind of comes after you're already really fluent in in the language but um, but this is actually a, I think that this chapter is a really good exposure to the way of thinking about exploratory data analysis and then walking you through some ways to accomplish it okay so off we go into <clears throat> the data sets that are used in chapter seven, okay? So the, the one data set that we're gonna really focus on today is called Diamonds. And it is a, it's a data set um, that in includes information about diamonds. So if you were to load the tidyverse in R and then under the help do, do question mark diamonds or, or in, the, in the terminal, type question mark diamonds and launch that, then you'll find out a whole sheet about this data set itself. So what it, <clears throat> what it covers here, the data set has 10 columns or 10 variables. The first one is price, which is price in US dollars. The second one is carats, which is the weight of the diamond. And you'll notice that this ranges from 0 0.2, 0 0.2 carats all the way up to 5.01 carats, okay? There's cut where it talks about the quality of the cut and, and the cut comes in one of five categories, fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal. And then the color of the diamond goes from D, which is the best, down to J, which is the worst. There's also a category for a variable for clarity. You can see that that goes from I1 to SI2 and so on up to, up to those. Then there's three variables related to measurements uh, about the diamond. So the length is in X, the width is in Y, the depth is in Z. And then there's two other variables, depth and table, which are just ratios, uh, some of these measurement ratios, okay? So, so that was a quick walkthrough about this data set. And you can see that these are the variables and some information about each of those, all right. Then if in the terminal you write, you, you type in head and then parentheses diamonds, it'll give you the first few rows of the diamonds data set. So we can see again, just what we were talking about. Here's a column for carrots. You can see the values um, that some of those are taking. Here's cut, again, ideal, premium, good. You can see ideal, premium, good comes, uh, is there. Color matches to the, the range that we talked about a second ago, clarity, and then depth and table, those are the ratios. We won't get into those too much, and then price. And then you can see these last three, X, Y, and Z, have to do with the measurements, uh, length, width, and depth, okay? Cool, all right. And then 
there's a total, the total number of records in the data, data set is almost 54,000, okay? <clears throat> good, everybody good on this? Any questions? Make sense? All right, should be pretty straightforward. It's a fairly simple, uh, albeit long data set. All right, cool. So when it comes to the actual uh, visualization, um, visualizing the distributions and doing the actual data analysis, we might start by asking ourselves the question, but let me let me figure out how many how many diamonds belong to each value of the cut variable. Just simply the cut variables and how many diamonds are in each one. Okay. So then you might say, well, first of all, what are the values of the cut variable? So we have here, like we were looking at a second ago, fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal. Okay. And then you'll ask what type of geome would work best for this, noting that cut is a categorical variable, okay? <clears throat> so really quickly on categorical variables, those are gonna be variables that can only take one of a few different va uh, values. Uh, and if it's, if it's a, a word like these are and not a number, then there's a, a very good chance that it's gonna be a categorical variable, okay? So, so this is a categorical variable. There's not a whole lot of options. There's only five different options. <clears throat> and all we want to do is just count the number of diamonds in each one of these categories. Okay. So when you ask yourself what type of geome would work best for this, and remember that geome is the way that R talks about the type of chart, line chart, bar chart, scatter plot, all those, all those are different geomes. Okay. So the type of geome that would work best for this, knowing that it's a categorical, categorical variable and that we're just looking at the, at the count, um, would, be, uh, would be a bar chart, okay? In fact, that's the chart that, that it, it comes up as in the book as well, okay? So I'm gonna let you guys take a second now in R and to, to create a graph that shows the number of diamonds that belong to each one of these uh, these cut variables. Okay, and if you want to look at the hint, I've got this hint down here. Okay, where it has just some blank spaces <clears throat> that tells you what goes into those spaces. Okay, so I'll leave this up. If you want to look at it, if you want to try and do it on your own, you can as well. Okay, so let me give you a minute to work on this, and. Um, and then we'll get back together in maybe two or maybe two minutes and somebody can walk us through through their answer. Sound good? Okay. And I am going to step away for just a second. My daughter did not get lost on her way over here. So I got to go talk to her real quick. One second, please. All right. Anybody ready that wants to share? You guys need another minute or are you good? Okay. Colin's good. Bruno, you want to try this one? Yeah, you can try. Okay. Uh, I use the data diamond, right? Right. And the geom bar I use to map the category mm -hmm. variables. And X point to the cut variable. Okay, exactly right. So, yeah. so if you come up with this, so ggplot data equals diamonds plus geom underscore bar and mapping equals 
AES or aesthetic and X equals cut. Okay. If you complete this and you run it, you should generate um, a, a view that looks like this. Okay. First, I try with geom count, count, but it work. With the, you say geom underscore count? Yeah, I search and I think I need to count the numbers of each one, right. but it didn't work, so I remember the the bar. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So, so you might wonder, well, how did how did geom bar know that I wanted a count as opposed to like say an average width or, or average something so that that count at least for geom bar count is the default okay so you can specify something else you can specify some or you can specify something else if you wanted to but you can just go with count um, as a default on geom bar and if you wanted to change that to if it was a different kind of geom it's going to have it could have a different um a different default calculation method. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything they want to add or any questions? Good. All right. Stop me if you do. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, so we've now done, we've counted using the cut variable. But now using diamonds, let's visualize the number of diamonds that belong to each value of the caret variable. Okay, remember that caret has to do with the weight. Okay, so you look and you say, what are the values of the caret variable? Okay, and like we talked about earlier, it's the weight of the diamond, and it goes all the way from 0 0.2, tiny, tiny diamond, up to 5.01. Um, uh, which is a fairly large diamond, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so as we ask ourselves these kinds of questions, the next question being like, what type of geome would work best for this, knowing that caret is a continuous variable, okay? So, so as opposed to the categorical variable that we looked at for cut, where there was five different possibilities and they were words, Instead, this is a continuous variable, meaning that the weight of the diamond could take any one of an infinite number of, of values. And depending on the precision, you could either have a, a like point, 0 0.2 carats, 0 0.21, 0 0.213, you know. Um, so it could take any number of different values in this continuous variable, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so, so in order to do any kind of geometrics, any kind of visualization on that, we have to generate a bin, which is kind of answering the question, would, will 2.0 carats and 3.0 carats be in the same bin? Like, are we gonna specify and say that two and three are gonna be basically the same thing? Or what about 2.1 carats and 2.2 carats? those might be in the same bin. So if we were to say that each integer caret, each integer was a bin, then we would have a bin for zero, another bin for one, another bin for two, three, four, and five. Yeah, so roughly six bins or so. But if we wanted to specify that it's a, a tenth of a caret decides the bin size, now we've got a bin for 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 5.0, okay? So that's a total of 50 bins. And then if we were, if on the other hand, we wanted to specify two decimal points, now we would have one for 0 0.01, 0 0.02, all the way up to five, and that would generate 500 bins, okay? So it's this question of how, what size do you wanna make the bins so that they're not so they differentiate, so they, they differentiate the values just enough, okay? All right, so let's create the graph in R and hopefully this idea of these bins will make a little more sense in just, uh, in just a second, okay? So here is, here is the hint and I'll let you, I'll take a minute to try to create the visualization 
for the caret variable, okay, instead of a cut. Anybody want to volunteer right now to go over their answer as soon as they're they get it? All right, then be thinking. Okay, I'll give you about 30 more seconds to work on this one. Time's up on this one. Let's uh, let's just go through these through these blanks here, and I'll just call on people to see if they want to to weigh in. So, Sandra, what, what would you put down here for the data set? Don't forget to go off. So, sorry, diamond. Right. So, data set and diamonds. Okay. And then, what would you put for the geome type? Uh, bar. Okay, bar. Uh huh. That would be, that'd be one possibility. The book actually has a different one, but we'll, um, I, I could have given you the hint on that one, I guess. So the, the book actually uses a histogram on this one, okay? But we'll work through the rest of these then. What would you put for variable? So it's, uh, we are using carat. Right, carat. Mm -hmm. And then because, because uh, the geome that the book asked for was histogram, that requires a special argument, which is the bin width that we were just talking about. Okay, so let me just put up here what the, the book pr provides as a, as a response on this one. So yes, diamonds, the geome is histogram. Okay, and then carrot we got, and then the, the histogram geome requires this other argument called bin width. And for this example, it specifies 0 0.5 as the bin width. So you can see over here, we have, we have a bin that goes from, I'm just gonna guess maybe zero to 0 0.5. This next one goes from 0 0.5 to one, one, uh, one to 1 1.5 and so on, right? So each of these bars represents a, a width of 0 0.5 carats, okay? So in here we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six big ones, and then, a number of small ones down here that you can barely see. Okay. But that's the that's the responsibility of this argument of bin width is to break down this this long continuous range of numbers here to break it down into segments that are equal so that the values can each drop into these bins. Okay. So it's up to us to decide what that bin width would be that's most appropriate. Okay. Everybody good? Questions? Okay. Well, what is the difference of histogram and density? Between yeah. histogram and density? Yeah, density I saw that they create a, it's yeah. similar. Yeah, it's similar. I don't think that there's much of a difference. Um, I can't say for sure, but there is a, I, I, I think it, they both approach the problem with this idea of bins and adding in the values within each bin. Okay. Anybody else have any input on density graphs? Okay. okay, good question, thanks. Okay, so we'll move on then to the next one here. So we noticed, like we were talking about just a second ago, we noticed that there are very few diamonds larger than 2.5 carats. Okay, so now let's filter the data set to only include diamonds under 3.0 carats, okay? So there's some out here, but there's not very many and we just are gonna ignore those, okay? 
All right, so then to do this, let's think about how to do this with the pipe operator that we, that we talked about last week, okay? So here might be a way that you can think through this one. What data set would you start with? And what would you do to it next? So if you start with the data set, then you would say to yourself, and then I do what? And then, and then I do what? And then I do, do what, okay? <clears throat> so every time that you say, and then, that's where a pipe goes, okay? And what dplyr verbs do we need in order to accomplish those different steps? And then you can think about ways to research the arguments that those verbs need, and then be aware that graphing with ggplot can follow a pipe operator, okay? All right, so I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to think about this one. Um, I, I, I'm probably just gonna move on to the, uh, to the answer that I came up with, but I do want to at least give you a couple of minutes to think through how you might approach this one, okay? Because keep in mind that we're trying to filter out these, anything with the caret greater than 3.0, okay? All right. So, the way that it's presented in the book is that we start out with the data set diamonds, okay? And then we want to filter out anything with a caret that's less than three. So we start out with diamonds and then we use the pipe operator to next apply the filter. And this is a dplyr verb filter. And then we go into the graphing portion, ggplot, plus geom histogram, et cetera, okay? So just uh, this is, I think part of the value here is so that you can see how you move from a data set, transform that data set in some way, and then move on into the, into the graphing of that data set, okay? This makes sense to everybody, okay? Using the pipe. All right, and then once you apply this, you can see that we've, we've knocked off everything that's greater than three carats, okay? So the, the filter is now applied in this, in this visualization. All right, so just as a sidebar, talking about the pipe operator in action, okay? This is the same, uh, the same code that we just looked at a second ago. And you might ask yourself, what arguments does the filter verb take? Okay, right here. And you can search for this, you can do a help search for filter. And you'll see that the first argument that the filter verb takes is a data, it's the data set. Okay, so you think about this, <clears throat> where if you wanna tell R to filter, the, filter a data set for carrots less than three, or Filter, uh, filter a data set for origin airport of JFK. Well, it needs to know that data set first before it can do any filtering onto it, right? So that's why it, use, it takes this data as the first argument um, in, the, in the filter verb. You can see it down here as an example. There's a data set in, in the tidyverse called Star Wars. And so if you want to filter, you have to filter the Star Wars data set where the species is equal to human or where the mass is greater than a <clears> thousand. <throat> but importantly, we don't include that data set argument when you're using the pipe, okay? You can see that we've left that out entirely. We only, we only include the filter, the filter information, okay? The reason is, is because that pipe will take the previous results and pass those on to the next activity. So diamonds automatically moves over into filter and then filter automatically moves over into the graphing code. So the pipe moves the results to the next step. Don't repeat the data argument, okay? Make sense? Okay. And it makes it easy because now you don't have to remember to include this data every single time. You just, you create it, then you pipe it, then you do the next thing, and, and the, in this case, filtering is the most important part. Then you pipe, and then graphing is the most important part. You don't even need to specify which data set you're using in the graphing step because 
it knows that it's going to be graphing the results of this activity here. Okay. All right. So just a sidebar about the pipe and how the pipe works. Okay. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful. All right. So then we're back to, to this, uh, this exercise here. Now we had talked uh, just a minute ago about this bin width being, being 0.5 carats and going all the way from zero to 0.5 and then from 0.5 to one and one to 1.5 and so on. What if we thought that this was not, um, we, we, that we wanted to change the bin width from 0.5 down to 0.1. Okay? So what's gonna happen when we change the bin width from 0.5 to 0.1? Okay. So instead of, if, if we change the bin width, as you can see, we've done here, then instead of each bar showing the number of diamonds from zero to 0.5 and 0.5 to one, now each bar shows the number of diamonds from zero to 0.1 and 0.1 to 0.2 and so on. Okay. So as you'd expect, we have now a lot more bars because now these bars are only going one tenth of a carat instead of half of a carat. Yeah. So not only are there more of them, they're also skinnier. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Does anybody want to take a second to key this in, or I'll give you I'll give you just a second if you wanted to update your R code to change this bin width number and see how it, how it displays. If you run into any problems, mention it and we'll talk through it. Everybody get it? I just wanna add one thing. I don't know if you're gonna, I, I don't know if this is coming next. So um, I also thought in the book when it did the diamonds count cut width, to show the actual calculations. I thought that was, when I saw that, it made a little more more concrete to see the actual numbers. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of cool. I don't know, I just wanted to make a comment about it because I didn't notice that before. And I thought that was kind of neat to just see the actual calculation of what those bars are by using that count cut width and then changing it with you know, 0 0.5 or 0 0.1. You're talking about the cut width argument? Yeah, so there was like in the book, there was like where you could pipe diamonds into that D player verb counts. And mm -hmm. then inside counts, it's like cut underscore width. And then you take the variable and then you set the bin width itself and it makes that calculation. Mm -hmm. And it shows you like how many, how many are in each bin. I thought that was kind of informative too. Yeah. Um, I, it's in the chapter it's right after kind of the stuff but like i said i think it's kind of informative to see the actual calculation okay yeah yeah that, that's cool um i didn't have any slides on that but we can definitely talk about it maybe next week we'll i see. have a small question yeah if we have a value of 0.1 so will it go in the in in the bin of 0 to 0.1 or 0.1 to 0.2 it's a good question i don't know right off I don't know if it's inclusive or exclusive, how it works. Anybody know? I, I don't think, know what is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's inclusive or exclusive, but if you look at the kind of what I was talking about before, I think it will show you the actual ranges that it's using. Mm -hmm. So I think it might be inclusive. I'm going to say it's inclusive, but that's just what I, I think. Well, we'll find out. I can't remember off the top of my head. Any other questions? Everybody good with this? Success? Did it work? All right. Very good. All right. So then um, let's say that the next thing that we want to analyze is that we want to fill, underlined here, fill the histogram bars with color based on the cut variable. Okay. So how would you do this? Okay. And to get us ready to answer that question, here's a, here's a mini quiz. First of all, what do you call a graphical element like fill in ggplot? Hopefully this isn't like you're trying to read my mind on this one. 
but any kind of a graphical element like a like a, a bar or a dot or a color or anything is referred to as an aesthetic. Okay. All right. So in the case of, uh, of, of a histogram here, this idea of filling the histogram bars with color, um, how do you assign the fill aesthetic to be mapped to the cut variable? Okay. And here are your, here's your multiple choice options. A is fill equals cut. B is cut equals fill. C is fill parentheses cut. And then D is cut parentheses fill. Who wants to take a guess at which one it is? Keeping in mind that the, that the aesthetic is fill and then the variable name is cut. Is A. It's A. Yes, indeed. Okay. So fill equals cut, right? And then the next question, does fill equals cut go inside the aesthetic or outside the aesthetic and why? Anybody want to tackle that one? When I say inside the aesthetic, I mean inside of here next to x equals caret, like comma fill equals cut, or outside would just be more like where this bin width is outside the aesthetic. Inside. I inside? I'm guessing. Yep, inside and why? Why? Why would it go inside instead of outside? Because that's part of the mapping, uh, that, that part of that uh, AES. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay. so anything inside of the aesthetic gets mapped to a variable. So the values in the variable determine what the color is or what the fill is or the, the size of the line, that sort of thing. So because we want those fill colors to be mapped to the actual values of cut, then we put it inside the aesthetic. All right. So then if you do that, and I'll give you a second to do it on your, in, in your system as well. If you add this part here, fill equals cut. then you should get this visualization like this. Okay. Everybody got that? Is that what, was that what came up? Hopefully. Anybody not get it? Okay. Success then. All right. So now this stacked bar chart is poor because most categories of cut do not start at zero. The idea being that here you can see the ideal starts at zero. That's kind of the lowest, it's in the lowest position. So you can see how these um, different categories compare to each other, but it's much harder to interpret that for any of the other categories. So we can't really very easily compare this one, this, uh, this premium color to this premium color and so on and see how those change. So we'd really like to change the geome to something where they all start at zero, okay? So, um, so the best way to do that and the way that, that the book talks about doing that is with the freak, 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 poly, frequency poly, okay? So this, this visualization is better for that, okay? So this time the aesthetic name is color instead of fill, okay? So I'll give you a second to make those changes and see if you come up with, uh, with what visualization you come up with on that, okay? I'll give you a second to update yours, your working code.
Okay. So after you make those changes, you should have here geom underscore frequency poly. And then you've also hopefully changed this part from fill to color, but the rest of it can remain. And then, um, then you should end up with line graphs here. Okay. And now everything starts at zero. You can kind of see how for each line, you can see how they adjust to each other over, over as the carrots increase. Okay. Everybody get it? Success? All right. Well, good. Any questions on anything that we've covered up to this point on any of these visualizations or anything uh, with the code? Any trouble that you had along the way? Only because we're getting to the end of the of the slides here. So this actually ends the like the, the new content part. So we'll give you a second if there's anything you want to bring up. No, I'm good. All makes sense. Okay. Well, then that's that's it for for the content of what we wanted to cover in in this chapter up to this point. Um, I'll always put up this slide for different ways to get help. You can ask questions here, Google, um, the Slack, all these different all these different resources exist. Okay. And then for next week, there's one more section in chapter seven that I wanted to cover. Um, and that's gonna be about zooming in to sections of the plot. And then from there, we'll carry on with section 7.4, which, takes, which uh, starts to talk about missing values, okay? And then we'll just move on to the rest of section seven from that, okay? All right, anybody have anything else that they wanna add or thoughts? Well, I think that um, if not, I think that it's, it's probably a good time to congratulate ourselves. We've made it five weeks so far going through this book. Um, it's, a, it's, it's quite an investment, I think, in, in, each of, in each of you. You know, you're working on um, it, with your jobs or with, uh, with your studies, trying to make a difference in the world for yourselves and for your families. And this is just an opportunity to learn a little bit more and, and get even better at, at what you're doing. So um, with that, we'll finish up for today. And uh, I congratulate you on making it through week five. Don't forget to, uh, to start to, uh, or to be thinking about any of these lessons that you'd like to take on to teach. Um, and also make sure that you do the exercises. And with that, that's all I've got. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. All right, everybody have a great week and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Right. See you all, bye. Yeah, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.